Well, we'll try this. I'm recording this uh, this morning just before you come to church. It's Sabbath morning, September 18th. My purpose today is to take a look at the signs of the times and the kind of faith we need to make it through. Would you just pray with me, please? Well, Lord, hear my prayer. Help me to speak that my hearers may have their faith awakened anew, that you, almighty God, are still on the throne and do care about how we, your people, are affected by the challenges and troubles that we face today and that you are actively working to help us walk in the faith of Jesus. Amen. Pardon me for a commercial. I need to close this door in case my dog starts barking. Well, I certainly don't want that to happen and have him ruin everything. <laughs> that would certainly be a bad sign. The title of my sermon today is Trouble and Faith. What are the signs of your faith? Do they strengthen you or weaken you in times of trouble? Today being September 17th, we are now seven days past the 20th anniversary of September 11th, 2001. A day like December 7th, 1941, even many decades before, a day that Americans will never forget. Perhaps each person remembers it differently, the attacks in our nations and the lives that were lost, the servicemen and women and civilians that were lost at Pearl Harbor and the civilians and the firemen and the policemen and others that were lost on 911. Attacks on our nation at forces from the outside. Seventh-day Adventist Bible students see more to the story than just attacks on this country. The story known as the Great Controversy or the war between good and evil. Today, we watch the signs of the times. And what do they reveal? They reveal that Jesus is coming soon, don't they? Or do they reveal something else? Something of worry, something of trouble. Jesus had given a troubling sermon. He spoke a rapid series of woes, primarily on the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You find it in Matthew chapter 23. And why did he do this? Because those particular religious leaders, the Pharisees and Sadducees in particular, as well the Pharisees and the scribes even too, were leading people astray. They refused to receive his teachings and they were actively working to counteract his teachings and to condemn him and to get people not to receive him, not to accept him. They were trying to create distrust among the people towards Jesus. It was the last week of his life on earth, and the cross loomed before him. He had preached this sermon, this sermon of woe, at the temple. And he was leaving the temple and lamenting over Jerusalem. And over the centuries, he lamented how over the centuries they had killed the prophets and stoned those whom God had sent to them to teach them about righteousness. Imagine that. They were not willing to receive the teachings of God, nor were they willing to do God's will. And now they were ready to crucify Jesus. They had just rejected their last chance for repentance. And then Jesus pronounced one final woe. He said, Matthew 23, 38, you should see the scripture up there on the screen. He said, see, your house is left to you desolate. But how could this be? The disciples must have thought, really? How could the Jewish temple, the temple of the living God, ever be made desolate? Well, Jesus already had given an answer to that, but they did not understand his answer. 
What was his answer? Let me bring this up here so I can change it better. What was his answer? He said, For I say to you, you shall see me no more until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Matthew 23, verse 39. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He said, You will see me no more. He revealed to them that in fact, in that statement, you will see me no more, that he, Jesus, was the very presence of God. And the temple, you know, the temple depended on the presence of God. In times past, the Shekinah glory of God would fill the temple. And what they did not realize is that Jesus was very God. He was the very presence of God. And when he left that temple, he left it desolate, never to come back. God's presence never to come back to that temple. Think about the ramifications of that, the implications of that. That they would see him no more. But the disciples did not yet understand that. They were troubled by the woe that Jesus pronounced on the temple. Jesus had just said it would be desolate. Where would they worship if there was no temple? The temple was their rock. It was the pride of the Jewish economy, the pride of Jewish life. It was a wonder of the world. Herod the Great had rebuilt that temple after it was in decay about 50 years earlier. Remember, they said it took 46 years to build this temple. And this was an important topic for them to understand. So, Matthew chapter 24, Luke chapter 21, and Mark chapter 13 all record the conversation between Jesus and the disciples. And they had to ask because they did not understand, so they asked him, Teacher, see what manner of stones, what buildings are here? The stones that made up the temple were huge. Some of those stones weighed as much as 100 tons. Most of them were over 28 tons that made up the foundation when Herod rebuilt it. He more than doubled the area of the Temple Mount, made it magnificent. It was the most magnificent structure of the times. When it was finally destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans, they did not want to destroy it because that's how magnificent it was. The gold of the temple, the colors and hues, truly magnificent. But Jesus simply answered them. He said, Do you see these great buildings? Mark chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. But the disciples, they were still troubled. Could something like this shake their faith? So Peter and his brother Andrew and John and his brother James came to Jesus. Mark says in Mark 13, verse 3, Mark says, privately. And what did they ask him? They wanted to know, when will these things be? Tell us when these things will be. And tell us what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age that's in Matthew 24, verse 3, a combination of both Mark and Matthew there. Well, how did Jesus answer them? Because his first concern was that they should not be deceived. He said, take heed that no one deceives you. That was the first answer he gave. And then he developed a long list of trials and troubles that would go on from that time forward through the centuries up until our time today. He said, take heed that no one deceives you. During the time that Jesus preached and ministered, during that time, he was opposed by the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes. He was opposed by the Jewish leaders. His teachings were opposed. His, even his miracles were opposed. 
Yes, even in the synagogues. That would be the church of his day. It wasn't called the Christian church yet, so we'd call it the Jewish church or the Old Testament church. Even among the religious leaders, yes, but even among the common people, Jesus constantly encountered opposition. Yes, there were many who believed in him. Certainly they believed in him, but there were many others who refused to accept him, refused to believe in him, and opposed and countered what he was doing. Do you think it would be any different today than when Jesus started, when Jesus started his church 2,000 years ago, the Christian church? Do you think it would be any different for the Christian church today than it was for the Old Testament church? He counseled and warned his disciples that many would come in his name and would attempt to deceive. And he said many would be deceived. How could be people be set up to be deceived? Would that happen to us? Could it happen to us? Could we be set up to be deceived? Many people are afraid of that. Well, I believe what the Bible teaches. And the Bible teaches that all people, all of us, have a problem called sin. And because of that, we all have a tendency to be lovers of ourselves. People are lovers of themselves. It's part of our sinful nature. So we have to be aware of this tendency in ourselves because the devil works through flattery and he will flatter your opinions and he will flatter your pride. And you won't even think it's your pride that's being flattered because the devil will try to make it look like it's of the Lord. Jesus warned, many will come in his name. That's what that means. It's of his teachings. How many different teachings today claim to be teachings of Jesus, and yet they don't line up with Scripture? How many people have claimed to be the Christ? How many people have claimed to be a prophet? And maybe not claim to be a prophet, but there are many in any church, including our church, who act with the authority of prophets towards other people, and they're condemnatory and judgmental instead of being loving. And these kind of people pervert a proper understanding of the signs of the times, for Jesus gave signs that would precede his coming. Wars and rumors of wars, famines, pestilences, pestilences like the one we're in right now, commotions, earthquakes, Nations will rise against nations. Kingdoms will rise against kingdoms. People will rise against one another. Yes, even within the church, people will rise in opposition to their fellow church members or to the fellow Christians. They'll rise also in opposition to proper Bible teachings. The devil will cause people to rise against righteousness itself. Yes, this will happen even within God's church. It's certainly been going on already for 2,000 years, hasn't it? And people's good tendencies, for we do have some good tendencies in this too, because God put those there, people's good tendencies will falter. Why? Because Jesus said there would be so much lawlessness. Let me bring that scripture up. It says, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will do what? It will grow cold. The love of many will grow cold. Now, while it is true that the laws of the land are broken, Jesus was speaking about lawlessness against God's law. And the greatest effect of lawlessness, what does it do? It causes the love of many, remember? to grow cold. It causes the love of many to grow cold. Let me just leave that scripture up there so it'll be there to linger as I talk about this next part. You see, because the devil is especially attacking God's law so that he can cause the many, of, many people's love to grow cold. And because today people hold God's law in disregard, don't they? The fifth commandment says what? Honor your father, and your mother. But today there is a breakdown of traditional family. The traditional family, there's a breakdown of values. 
it leads to what? Dishonoring of parents. And it also leads, because I believe that commandment speaks to how fathers should not exasperate their children and parents should love their children. There is a lack of love for children today, even within families. And, and the breakdown of the family unit, fathers not in the home and non-traditional marriages occur, you know, the LGBTQ stuff, and they raise kids, but they're not raising them in the law of God, of course. The love of many is growing cold. The sixth commandment, what does it say? Do you know the sixth commandment? You shall not murder. Remember, Jesus said, even if you're angry with your brother, you're guilty of breaking that commandment. And there's a disrespect, therefore, a dishonor of human life, murders in our communities, hatred, Rampant abortions all come under this do not murder commandment. And the seventh commandment, what does it say? It says, you shall not commit adultery. But there is a dishonor and a disrespect for traditional marriage and the marriage vow. Promiscuity is rampant among all classes. Yes, even among Christians. Have you ever been involved in that? It's time to repent and ask Jesus to help you out, for he won't condemn us if we repent. The Eighth Commandment says, you shall not steal, but property of others is not respected. Isn't that true? Thefts are frequent. The Ninth Commandment says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. But even among our elected officials, Men and women whom should be respected and should set good examples. There's a lot of lying going on, isn't there? There's slander of one another among fellow elected officials just to get elected. And what examples does that set? We hear about all kinds of lying and slandering of others' characters. How can we expect any better of our children when that's the example they see in society today. The Tenth Commandment, what does it say? Do you know the Tenth Commandment? You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, which means you shall not covet your neighbor's spouse, really. You know, so women shouldn't cover other women's husbands and men shouldn't cover other men's wives or their house. And because covetous is the root of much evil, much trouble in society today and also in the church, there's so much apathy. So much apathy. And what does that do to? What did Jesus say? Because lawlessness abounds against God's law. It's lawlessness against God's law. And when the fourth commandment is disregarded also, the fourth commandment, you know, the one that says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Much of the Christian world disregards it so that they dishonor God's holy Sabbath day as the seventh day of the week, like the Bible actually teaches, which Jesus said he was made for man, made it, God made it on the seventh day, the end of the week. And many Christians ignore that command or they consider it unimportant. Oh, just keep one day in seven or Sunday's okay. It doesn't matter as long as you worship God. Even today, many promote the first day of the week as the special day. The majority of Christianity, the special day of the week. Hmm. You know, what we call now Sunday, when God never blessed that day as holy, never made it holy. And what God did make holy, the seventh day of the week, human beings trample on much like people would trample on the flag. What can strengthen your faith, your faith amid, amidst all this trouble and unbelief? What can strengthen your faith? It is only the presence of Jesus in your life that can strengthen your faith. Write it down. It is only the presence of Jesus in your life that can strengthen your faith. All the signs not withstanding signs of the times I'm talking about, all the trouble in the world, you know, hurricanes, earthquakes, tornadoes, all that. But how can Christians expect the presence of Jesus in their lives? How can they expect Jesus to be with them 
when many are trampling upon God's law. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Remember, Jesus told the Pharisees and scribes, your house is left to you desolate. Because really, they were trampling on God's law too, because they weren't loving their neighbor as himself. They were condemning. And why was their house desolate? Because he was leaving the temple. Jesus was leaving the house. Leaving the temple. No more to come back to grace it with his presence. He said, you will see me no more until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You will see me no more until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But Jesus also told his disciples to be careful that no one deceives you. He's talking to us. Why? Because Christians would also become susceptible to a covetous lifestyle. Isn't that true? You ever been tempted? <laughs> Jesus warned us that our hearts could become weighed down with many things. Has your heart been weighed down ever? Is it weighed down now? The trials of life, the worries of life, things, Jesus said, like carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life. You know, let me speak a little bit to that, the cares of this life. I like watching sports, don't you? And I, I, I like watching running especially. Some like football, some like basketball, golf. But those are the cares of this life. Are you weighed down with them? Do they overwhelm your time so you have no time to seek the Lord or get to know Him better? The cares of this life. Soccer moms and soccer dads take their kids to soccer dutifully because they want their kids to have time with the kids and to compete. Uh, same thing with gymnastics. They take their kids to gymnastics and others take them to their track meets and cross-country meets or their football games. And quickly... It can become the cares of this life. We need to participate in things, I believe, like that. They're good for us. But over-participation, over-zealousness in that stuff becomes being concerned with the cares of this life. And mostly when we watch, like even the Olympics, do you think most of those people there watching or competing are thinking about God's law or that Jesus is coming? Or are they more concerned about winning? We need to be careful how involved we get with the cares of this life. That's why we need temperance. It's not that we're to put our heads in the sand and just live like hermits and not involve ourselves in anything. That's not correct. We need to have a balance in life. There needs to be temperance. We need the presence of Jesus in our life to strengthen our faith. These things can obscure the presence of Jesus in our life because they become too important to us if they're more important than Jesus in our life. And Jesus said that those things, the drunkenness, the crowds, and the cares of life, would lead people to not be ready for when the day of the Lord comes, when he returns. He said it will come upon them unexpectedly. How? Unexpectedly. They will not be ready because they were deceived. It will come, Jesus said, Luke 21, 35. Luke 21, 35. It will come as a snare on all those who dwell upon the face of the whole earth. That's real emphasis, isn't it? It will come up as a snare upon all those who dwell upon the face of the whole earth. A snare. Because they're not looking for it. They're not ready. They don't care about it. They don't care about the things of God. God wants to save everyone. He wants them to care about these things. He's trying to get their attention. How can he get their attention? How can he get their, our attention? Does he get our attention to help with the message? He called these things, by the way, the beginning of sorrows. They affect everyone on the earth, including believers. We're all affected by them. How we deal with them is the question. He says, don't be deceived. These are the beginning of sorrows. You know, it's, it's common knowledge today that all these signs... And troubles in nature are increasing greatly, are they not? It's an alarming, it's alarming the rate they're increasing at. The earthquakes, the hurricanes, 
the typhoons, the tornadoes, the flooding resulting from massive storms, and the pestilences like we're in now, and the fires. You've heard me talk about the fires before, but now the fires are threatening one of my favorite places on earth and one of my favorite things on earth, Sequoia National Park, where the largest living thing on earth, General Sherman, lives. It's a massive giant sequoia tree. And in total volume, it's bigger than any other living thing, over 272 feet tall. I remember as a kid, we, we would try to go up to it and put our arms around these big trees. You know, there'd be 10 of us stretching out hand to hand, arm to arm on these big trees, trying, just trying to get all the way around it. Huge trees. And these trees are special because they've lived, some of them, for 2,000 years. They resist fires. They have something in their bark, tannin, that resists fire. But recently, 10% of an of entire sequoia, giant sequoia population was destroyed by fire because these fires are more intense. The woods in California are so dry and so overgrown, it's causing more intense fires. And this may be the reason we're seeing World records for California every year. Each year seems to be like the greatest fire ever. And the one threatening Sequoia isn't so big, but it's threatening the National Park. They, they've evacuated the National Park. They've evacuated everyone out of there. The fires are less than a mile away from giant forest where these grove of trees are. And in a place called the Congress Trail among giant forests is where General Sherman is found. Wow. How many of them will burn? Will General Sherman burn? A piece of my heart will go. God says he will destroy those who destroy the earth. What's causing these fires? Isn't it our irresponsible way of not caring for the earth properly? Surely, God gave man dominion over the earth. He says, care for it. And instead, man abuses the earth and abuses the earth. As I get ready to close, I want to take you to Luke chapter 21, beginning at verse 25. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars. Seventh-day Adventists believe those particular signs happened. Back in the 18th century, there was what was called the dark day, when the sun was darkened and there was not an eclipse and there were no clouds. And that very night, the moon turned to blood. It was a sign. And a few decades later, around 1833, I believe it was, the stars fell from heaven, the greatest meteor shower ever. And people thought it was the end of the world. It was in all the papers. It was seen all across the East Coast and most of that side of North America. We believe those were signs saying the end of the world is coming. The end of the world is coming. Signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, what did Jesus say? He said, you see it on screen there. Look up. Look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. For God's people, the second coming of Jesus will put an end to all the calamities, all the commotion, all the woes that we experience in this life, all the trouble. And at that time, Jesus will call the sleeping saints back to life again. And he will call the living saints upward to meet him with them in the air. And all will receive those new bodies and will never know death again, nor sorrow, nor suffering again. And they'll meet him in the air and take him to heaven. Because he says, lightning flashes from the east to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And he won't set foot on this. He says, see that no one deceives you because Christ will not set foot on this earth. He's coming in the sky. He's coming in the clouds of heaven. All these signs are preceding that. 
This call of Jesus to his people will be a call to life immortal. For this mortal must put on immortality, the scripture says. Until then, how can we live? How can our faith be strengthened to live during these troublous times, which are going to get worse? Because there's coming a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, the prophet Daniel writes. Such as never was since there was a nation. So until then, we should keep his commandments, follow his will, live by faith in the Son of God, which is also known by the faith of Jesus, Revelation 14, verse 12. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And we should seek his presence every day. Why? Because that's he wants to dwell with us. That's how he helps us through each day. And we should pay attention to the signs of the times. Here's what Ellen White wrote. In Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, page 11. How's that for a 911 wake-up call? Testimonies, Volume 9, page 11. She wrote, The agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating. They are strengthening for the last great crisis. Great changes are soon to take place in this world, and the final movements will be, do you know the last two words? Rapid ones. Signs are increasing rapidly. People are going to be surprised, unfortunately. It is only the presence of Jesus that can strengthen your faith. If you have God with you, Emmanuel, God with you, if you live according to his faith and you love your neighbor as yourself, love God supremely, you have nothing to worry about. What are the signs of your faith? Is your faith strengthening or is it weakening amidst all this trouble going on. Jesus said, now when these things happen, or he actually said, now when these things begin to happen, he said, look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draws near. He has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He has sent us the promise of his Holy Spirit to be with us always. You can have his presence with you. How? If you, will if you will receive the Holy Spirit into your heart, into your mind. Is there anything that is getting in your way from receiving the presence of Jesus into your heart? Anything. Any care of this life that's getting in your way. Any trouble, any sin. Do you want to accept the presence of God into your heart to receive the Holy Spirit? Who among you wants God to come into his or her heart? Raise your hand if you do. Lift your heart to him if you do. Tell him you can have his presence with you if you will receive the Holy Spirit into your heart. Is there anything that's getting in your way today that keeps you from accepting the presence of God? into your heart. Do you want a daily experience with Jesus? Who wants his presence within you? Just raise your hand as I pray. Father in heaven, help us all that we may receive your Holy Spirit, receive the presence of Jesus through the Holy Spirit into our hearts and minds each day. I pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.